Hi, Experience Church. We're so happy to be here with you today. My name's Kelly. This is Adam and Liam. We're the Clark family. I love being a part of the community here at Experience. Particularly now, it has allowed me to connect with other guys in meaningful ways. I'm a part of the Men's Monday Night group, and you're welcome to join us anytime. It's also so encouraging to talk with other people about life's ups and downs as we think through different ways of making our faith practical. Whether you've been attending for months or this is your first time joining us, I want to encourage you to take the next step today and connect with others. Yes, connecting with other people can be as simple as saying hi in the chat window or maybe taking a bigger step and signing up for a group. If you're new or have questions, text ECC info to 94000. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Today, we're gonna to hear a message, have an opportunity to take communion together and sing to God in worship. You'll also hear about other ways to get plugged in here at church.
my victory When all I see is a mountain You see a mountain moved And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted. I, oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet. Oh, I sing to the I'm Carrie Silver, Director of Ministries, and I'm so thankful we have this time together. Ladies, mark your calendars. Saturday, June 5th, we're going to circle up at Miller Park with our coffee or tea in hand and connect and just enjoy a beautiful morning together. More information about this event can be found at the link in our chat or on our website under events. 
Also, every second Saturday, a team from Experience serves with Good Works to help low-income families in Coastville with home repair. There is work to be done for any level of skill, and we would love to have you join in. More information about this opportunity can be found at the link in our chat or under serve on our website. And each week at Experience, we have an opportunity to partner together in the mission to show the love of Jesus to others. You can do so safely at gifttoexperience.com. And now, week two of Empowered. Do you have a green thumb? How do plants and you get along? Like if you were given a flower to plant and take care of it, would it make it? Well, if you've ever had a garden or you've taken care of a garden or a flower bed, whatever it is, you realize that there's a fair amount of work to do, isn't there? You know, Quinn, our, my daughter, she has a raised bed garden and we are hoping to plant stuff in it this week. And when I say we, she will pick what we would get to plant. We will go to the garden. She will point out where she wants the plants to go. And then she'll probably have the best intentions of planting with me. She'll have a farm outfit on, like a flannel shirt. She likes to go a little extra. She may even put on overalls. She'll have her pretty gloves on. But as soon as she touches the dirt or gets dirty or sweaty, then she'll say, Dad, will you do it for me? And chances are I will probably end up doing it for her. Last Sunday, I planted about 15 annuals along our driveway. And it's a fair amount of work to plant flowers. And Quinn, she didn't want to help me. That's why I'm fairly confident that she won't want to help in this garden either. But if you plant flowers or garden, you know there are several things to consider if you want the flowers to grow properly. You must consider the quality of the soil, how much sun the plants will be exposed to, spacing between the plants, there's so much to consider. And where I planted them, it's along our driveway and it's not good soil. It's rocky and it's clay. So in order to plant the flowers there, I needed to dig a hole that was twice the size of the container, fill the hole with some organic potting soil, and then recover the mulch and drench the soil with water. Of course, I've planted them the hottest week of the year, so every day I've had to water those plants, okay? I watered them twice, and then I employed my son Nathan to do it the rest of the week. It's a beautiful partnership. And now that we've planted the flowers, let me tell you what happens. I care more about those flower beds now than I did. I notice when there's these dumb little weeds growing up there. You know, a few weeds are an eyesore, but if they could take over the bed, they could actually kill my plants and rob them of their nutrients. While this talk about flowers and plants and gardens, well, interestingly enough, the Bible is full of agrarian metaphors. So whether you live in the city or on a farm, you can connect with some of the Bible metaphors, I bet. You know, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God created the first human beings from the dust of the earth and placed them in a garden where they were offered access to fruit. When they disobeyed, the ground was cursed with thorns and thistles. That is when those things came into existence. In Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we see a restoration take place of that garden, another tree of life. You know, the Bible, again, is full of vineyards and vines. They have strong imagery there. Jesus calls his followers to be part of the vine and relying on God for sustenance. There's plenty of talk of scattering seeds, reaping what we sow, etc. And interestingly enough, Jesus described a unique measuring stick to use in order to determine how healthy his followers were. Jesus didn't encourage them to look at how strong they were and see what they could bench press. He didn't care how many followers they had on social media, their ability to coordinate outfits, nor their capacity to fit within social norms. Rather, Jesus insisted that as true followers, they could be identified by the fruit that they produced. In Matthew 7, he was in a conversation about being aware of false prophets. In verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. You know, Jesus said what we all know to be true. Our actions speak louder than our words. All of us, we can talk a good game, but what is it that we actually want to produce? This is challenging for all of us to consider. It's sobering. In the context of this verse was pointing at false teachers, but the principle can apply to every one of us. So the question is, how's your fruit? It's a question worth pondering. I've been reading the book, Life on the Vine, Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit, and it's played a heavy influence on this series. And I'd encourage you to listen to last week's podcast as we talked with the author, Dr. Philip Kinnison. He is such a great guy. Well, he pointed out another reason to hold on to the agrarian metaphors that are commonly used in scripture. And his point was this is they exhibit beautifully the connection of the Christian life of God's grace and our effort. You know, grace is defined as the unmerited gift of God extended to anyone willing to receive it. 
None of us can earn God's love, and it's something that we have to accept. Last week, I mentioned that we need grace not only to enter into a relationship with Jesus, but we need God's grace to continue in our relationship with him. If we want to grow in our Christ-like character, this requires our participation. God will not transform us without our consent and some effort on our part. There's a beautiful partnership captured beautifully in the metaphor of a farmer and his or her creator. I'd like to read you a quote from the book. All farmers know that there is always more work to be done than there is time to do it. Nevertheless, these same farmers also understand that much of what happens to the crops is beyond their control. There is much more for the farmer to do, but the farmer cannot make the seeds sprout, the sun shine, or the rain fall. In fact, it is only because the farmer trusts that these good gifts will continue to be given that the challenging and risk-filled enterprise of farming is undertaken at all. Grace and effort, gift and work, these must be held together. So what kinds of things does the farmer need to do? Well, a lot of the same activities you and I need to do to take care of a plant or a garden or some landscaping along our driveway. There's tilling to be done, planting, weeding, fertilizing, mulching, staking, pruning, and irrigating, and then harvesting. There's so much to do. There's plenty to do. But it's also critical to understand that some things are out of our control. Going back to being known by our fruit, where could we find a description of that kind of fruit? How can we identify the good fruit coming from a good tree? Well, Paul uses a list to describe what the fruit looks like in Galatians 5. Paul says, when God is at work in us, this is what comes out. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these, against these things. You know, we looked at this verse last week, and we'll continue to do so over the next eight weeks. Paul isn't writing an exhaustive list here. However, these are qualities that describe God's Spirit working in us. Again, notice where these fruits come from. Who is the producer? And the answer is the Holy Spirit. Trying to live these nine qualities out by your own power is pointless. You cannot do it in your own strength. It's like digging a hole, filling it with dirt, and then expecting strawberries to magically appear. If you want to grow strawberries, you're going to need to plant a seed, or if you're smart, an established plant, and you go outside of yourself to go get that strawberry. Trying to live out these qualities in your own strength is impossible. You know, last week I used this illustration here. I took a power strip, and I mentioned you and wanted you to envision this is in your home office. You know, you're plugging things into power, like here's your computer, here's your monitor, here is your, I don't know, we'll say your iPhone charger. And then let's say, oh, this will be your zoom light. Your, not, not your zoom light, your ring light. That'll make you look way better than everyone else on those Zoom calls because they can actually see you, right? And then you're like, okay, where am I gonna plug this strip in? And you look around and you're like, oh, cool. Hey, there's one more strip here. And you plug it in here and you wonder why things aren't working, right? This is a picture of trying to live out those fruits in your own power. You have to go to an outside power source. And that's really important for us not to lose sight of that, right? Last week we pointed out specifically that there's something that gets in our way, and the answer is that we do. You know, God doesn't force us to stay plugged into him for power. He allows us to be distracted. And Paul says it this way in verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Paul says eloquently what we already know is true. Nobody sabotages our goals like we do. You know, what keeps you from seeing my chiseled six pack? It's not the shirt that I chose to wear today. It's the dessert. It's the extra that I really enjoy eating that it's hard for me to withstand, right? That's why you don't see a six pack. My goal is, of course, I'd like to have one, but things get in the way. Why don't I sleep better or take more time off or exercise more? Well, why? Because I have work to do. I'm busy. Now, of course, I happen to be the one who creates the work and I have a really hard time creating a boundary where enough's enough. You know, I don't have to keep giving us examples, do I? We know the struggle is real. We get in the way of our own pursuits. Do you know what's really frustrating about my flower beds? You know, those flowers, they seem to always be in harm's way. The sun can scorch them, 
My kids play basketball in our driveway and they can crush them with a missed ball. Weeds appear seemingly out of nowhere and are an eyesore at the least, or they can crowd out the flowers at worst and kill them. There are grubs from below the ground attacking them. It all seems so unfair. The odds actually seem stacked against every one of those little flowers. So what's the point of the battle? Well, they're pretty. They smell nice. And if I talk to you about Quinn's Garden, well, the stakes are even higher, right? There, there's more on the line. There's lettuce, and there's carrots, and there's tomatoes, and there's cucumbers. They're all worth fighting for. And it's real maintenance. Left alone, the weeds will take over. The heat will kill those plants. The animals, they can get in there and eat them. It's not really fair, but fair is inconsequential, isn't it? If I want those plants to flourish, I have to understand that there is work that I must do. Yet it's also important for me to acknowledge that I needed to go outside of myself to get those plants in the first place, to purchase those seeds at the store. And again, this points back to the gift and the work that we all must do to see the fruit of the Spirit expressed in our lives, the divine partnership unfolding in our lives. Well, I hope these metaphors are helpful in helping you process how we live out the Christian faith. Our lives are meant to play a much bigger role than we could ever imagine. God has a much larger purpose for every one of us than we can accomplish in our own power. As we allow God to empower us and work through us, we can actually provide sustenance to a world starving and in need of redemption. Rather than us taking and being consumers of this world, God wants to work through us to give back to this world. That's really exciting things to think about. Choose any particular area of your life, your relationships, your workplace, your school, your neighborhood, your PTA, the Chamber of Commerce, your dance group, your nonprofit, you name it, and there's a human component of that organization. That means it's good, and that means it's bad, right? Well, God wants to empower you with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control to help those areas be fully charged. This week we're talking about love. It's the first quality mentioned, but it's the thread that holds the other eight together. Love is central to the Christian faith. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, you can probably finish that statement. In 1 John 4.8, John reminds us that God himself is love. Not that he's loving, but rather he is the definition of love. It is his substance. Jesus said all the commands are summed up by loving God and loving others. A commentary I was reading about Galatians 5 this week used a comparison of love and its correlation to the other attributes, the way light passes through a prism. The light bends as it passes through the prism, and as a result, the different colors that make up white light become separated. And this happens because each color has a particular wavelength, and each wavelength bends to a different angle. Much in the same way, if love was to pass through a prism, what would come out would be the qualities that God or that Paul used to express those components of love, mixing together, bending around each other. You know, one of our most difficult concepts when discussing love is our connection and usage of the word. It's tricky to define. You know, I googled, what is love? And you can find some really interesting thoughts. Some avoided the question with a redirect, a term that means zero in tennis. Some were really pessimistic. They said, it's the fall of every man and woman. It's temporary madness. It's just like flowers waiting to wither. That one really hurt this week. Some were quoted song lyrics, oh baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me no more. Some were very practical, but specific in the eyes of the beholder. Love is seeing the download time get lower, or when public restrooms have two-ply toilet paper. Very self-seeking there. But we say we love things, but many times we use this term for things that we enjoy simply for our benefit. Imagine this conversation between two people as they were talking about a man's love for fish. You know, a guy says, man, I just love fish. And the other's like, really? Me too? How so? And he said, oh man, give me some salmon with asparagus and diced potatoes and I'm in heaven. But the other guy's taken back. Oh, you don't love salmon. You love consuming salmon. You know, if you love salmon, you'd be focused on loving the salmon when it was alive. You would care for it. You would make sure it was good and, and comfortable. And you would take care of its habitat to make sure it was clean and had plenty of oxygen. I'm not sure that you love salmon at all. I, I think that I think you just, you, you just want salmon for yourself. And the other guy's like, yeah. <laughs> I guess you're right. I like consuming salmon. Love is indeed a complicated thing to discuss. And when we say that God is loving, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around what that really means. But what if we looked at aspects of God's love that distinguish them from how we often use that term? 
I'd like us to explore four expressions of God's love that can help us identify the kind of love that God wants to produce in us. The first one is this. God's love for us is completely undeserved. Central to the message of Christianity is the acknowledgement that God has come to us in love despite our rebellious nature towards him. Romans 5, 8 says, Jesus emptied himself and humbly took on the role of a servant to bring us back to God. He says there, God shows his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know, God's love is always a gift and we can do nothing to earn it. We don't clean ourselves up in order to be loved or noticed by God. God loves us and is constantly drawing us towards him. He woos us to love him. The second thing is God's love for us is consistent. Because God's love is not based on our merit, there is nothing that we can do that can keep God from loving us. His love is not a switch that keeps turning on and off based on our changing situations. God wants all his creation to turn to him. 2 Peter 3.9 says he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. You know, God loves us enough to not force us to love him back. He allows you the ability to choose to accept him or not. But when we love him, nothing can separate that love from us. Paul says in um, Romans 8, 38, he says, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Third, God's love for us is a suffering love. God does not love us from a distance, but rather, he loves us in the midst of hardships and distress. We see in scripture over and over again that God never stands by the wayside unaware and isolated from our suffering. As we explored in our last series, Jesus wept in response of grief at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. That he chose to suffer with the people. Paul says to us in Corinthians, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Fourth is, God's love has no boundaries. The normative call to love in the religious system back in the day was to love your neighbor. Jesus affirmed that all the commands were held together with a call to love. However, Jesus insisted that we should love our enemies as well. This is seen most clearly in the parable of the Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Jesus told this parable in response to a question asked to him. The guy had, who is my neighbor? What he's really asking is, who do I have to love or who should I love? You've probably heard this famous story that Jesus shared before. A guy, he was traveling between two cities and he ended up falling prey to a group of bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and they left him for half dead. And a couple folks passed by and paid him no attention at all. However, these weren't two ordinary guys. They happened to be the equivalent of a priest and a church staff member. They would have been easily recognized by their outfits, and they would have been likely characters to represent God well in caring for someone in need. When people heard they were passing by, they would have been like, yes, that guy's getting helped. But again, instead of helping, they crossed to the other side of the road, not only to avoid the dying man, but to also ensure their own safety. Then Jesus said a Samaritan came along, saw the injured man, and had compassion for him. He took care of the man's wounds, put the man on his own donkey, and took him to an inn where he checked him in and said, Take care of him and I'll be back to pay the tab. To the hearers of the story, this would have rubbed them the wrong way. We call this story the story of the Good Samaritan. But as Jesus told the story, he referred to him as a despised Samaritan because of the prejudice that Jews had against Samaritans. When Jesus finished the parable, he asked this simple question to the religious leaders. Which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. He was so frustrated by Jesus' story that he couldn't bring himself to save the Samaritan, so he called him the one who showed mercy. Well, then Jesus said to him, yes, now go and do the same. Jesus is making it very clear in this narrative that there should be no boundaries on whom we choose to love, that God does not have boundaries on who he loves. God reaches out to love even those that stand outside cultural and social norms and even loves those who identify themselves as an enemy of God. Jesus calls all his followers to exhibit God's empowered love to others. If you take these qualities of love seriously, you realize that love will cost you dearly. 
at minimally your comfort. At times, it can be a really hefty price. Expressing love to people we feel deserve it is easy, but loving others like God does, like he commanded, it can feel impossible. In our strength, I think it is. Mother Teresa had this to say about the love of God and the great commandment to love others. She says, this is the commandment of the great God, and he cannot command the impossible. Love is a fruit in season at all times and within the reach of every hand. Anyone may gather it, and no limit is set. So again, we find ourselves in a divine partnership, a mixture of grace and work. In order to produce this kind of love, we need God to empower us to do so. We allow God's Spirit to flow through us, yet we have the responsibility to do some of the work to support this process. Romans 5.5, 5, Paul says, We know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Yet in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 13, he talks so much about love, and then in 14, he says we're encouraged to pursue love. A little bit of effort on our part. Well, just like we read earlier in Galatians, our flesh or our desires go against God's love. This takes effort on our part, but to be clear, it is God's love that distinguishes us as Jesus' followers. Jesus says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Well, I want to end today by pointing out four ways to cultivate God's love working through us. These are ways to fight against the weeds in our flesh. The first is love others now. Don't wait to love people until they deserve it. We made it clear that God extends his love towards us even when we are in active rebellion against him. God wants to use his spirit in you to love others. God channeling his love through you to others could be the very force he uses to heal great wounds that they've experienced, and it can also help them understand that they are loved by God themselves. We are called to love others. The second one is to love unconditionally. Don't make your love conditional on people's actions. We are called to continue to express love towards others regardless of how we are treated in the process. You know, personally, we have friends that have chosen to foster children. And it's heartbreaking to hear stories of how these foster children fear that when they make a mistake, they'll stop being loved. That is an extreme case of conditional love, but it's heartbreaking. It takes a long time to prove to someone that love isn't conditional. And friends, we live in a society where conditional love is the norm. As a church, we work really hard to say we love you, regardless of what you believe or how you behave. We live this out because we believe God is calling us to do so. The third thing is love people in their messiness. It's easy to take a step back when people are facing hard times, but this is choosing to draw closer to others when they're hurting. Wisdom needs to be applied here because you don't want to be cut by the shrapnel found in their lives, but it should be clear that you're willing to be with people in their valleys as well as their mountaintop experiences. Sometimes we just want to avoid the drama, but it is clear that we are called to help those in need. And the fourth, to love everyone. Step across divides and love others with no exceptions. In the midst of cancel culture where we find it easier to navigate in the lanes of uniformity, Jesus expressed our need to reach beyond our comfort zones and love beyond boundaries. Beyond preferences, we love in a spirit of unity. Not uniformity, but unity. To love in these ways is unnatural. And it's going to require God working in us and through us. This week I was reading a collection of Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermons compounded in the book entitled Strength to Love. So much rich content about the need to love and to overcome hate. I want to read one quote there that stood out to me. Love is the most durable power in the world. This creative force, so beautifully exemplified in the life of our Christ, is the most potent instrument available in mankind's quest for peace and security. Napoleon Bonaparte, the great military genius, looking back over his years of conquest, is reported to have said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have built great empires. But upon what did they depend? They depended on force. But centuries ago, Jesus started an empire that was built on love. And even to this day, millions will die for him. Who can doubt the veracity of these words? The great military leaders of the past have gone and their empires have crumbled and burned to ashes. But the empire of Jesus, built solidly and majestically on the foundation of love, is still growing. It started with a small group of dedicated men who, through the inspiration of their Lord, were able to shake the hinges from the gates of the Roman Empire and carry the gospel into all the world. You know, friends... 
The world will know God's love by how we love it. That is a lot of responsibility. So the question is, what could God continue to accomplish if we allow him to work through us, to empower us to live out that kind of love, to be known by that kind of fruit? Four questions for you to take this conversation further. One, who does God want me to show his love to? Two, who have I loved conditionally? Three, who have I avoided because of their messiness? And fourth, what group of people have I found it hard to love? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the gift your son gave us, allowing us to reconnect with you. But God, thank you that he also wants to empower us through your spirit. That God, we don't have to do life on our own. That God, there is nothing more frustrating than to do the impossible. And so God, as we look at these fruits and to live them out as you call us to, it's impossible for us to do this on our own strength. So do we invite you into this space, in this divine mystery where we work hard, but also God, we live fully surrendered lives to you to empower us to live it out. So in that messy space, we want to partner with you, God, not for our benefit, but for yours. We want this world to know you, and we want this world to see your redemption take place. And God, it's humbling to know you want to do that work through us. So God, when we get it right, let us say thank you. When we get it wrong, let's ask for you to empower us so that we can live a fully charged life. We love you and we're thankful for you in Jesus' name. At this point in today's service, we will now take communion. We do this each and every week here at Experience, and I'm glad we do. Because even as we're separated due to quarantine, this is an act done by millions of believers every week. Communion for all of us is a time to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, giving up his life so that we may live connected to God. Go ahead and grab your communion elements. Please take the bread, which represents Jesus' body. And the cup, which represents the blood he shed for us for forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this time every week, allowing us to reconnect and live in your word. We thank you for your sacrifice and for the time that we get to spend with you every week. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We would love to connect further with you. Please reach out through info at experiencecc.org or take, take a look at our website to see what we have coming up for you. 